Welcome to Profit Led, a podcast by and for bootstrapped founders brave or crazy enough to grow a business to profitability with very few resources. Profit Led is brought to you by eWebinar, the leading automated webinar platform built to save you from doing the same webinar over and over again, from sales demos to customer onboarding to training. This season, Profit Led's host, Melissa Kwan, who is also co founder and CEO of eWebinar, will walk you step by step through the company's journey to a million. Melissa is a three time bootstrapper who has spent 13 years building startups. Together with co host and eWebinar COO, Todd Parmley, they will dive into one major topic per episode, sharing war stories, mistakes, and lessons learned as they grew the company to a million in annual recurring revenue 36 months after product launch. So buckle up, fellow bootstrappers. It's going to be one heck of a ride. Welcome to Profit Led Season 2, our Journey to a Million, Episode 17. My name is Melissa Kwan, co-founder and CEO of eWebinar and your host. And I'm here with my co-host, Todd Parmley, eWebinar's COO. Hey, Todd. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? Where are you? I'm okay. I'm back in Amsterdam where we have our uh, only home, our unpacking spot. And it's the middle of summer, so it's quite hot here. But it's uh, as we're recording this, it's middle of August. And I think we've been here a total of like 10 days. So it's been a, been a wild year. Yeah. I mean, New York gets very quiet in August. You know, we were in London last week and it, there was like nobody in the city. Yeah. That's how it is here. We went to this comedy show, like in Shortage, which is like the Williamsburg, I guess, of London. And it was a Thursday and they said it was the quietest, like the emptiest show they've had in two years. And it was so tough on the comedians. And first of all, I think stand-up comedians are like the bravest people on earth, but they were struggling so hard because it was already Thursday. So it was like, not like cream of the crop, but you didn't get reactions because there was like 20 people. Actually, I've seen like amateur night in West Village in the past and it was so, so bad. But everybody starts somewhere. So I still have respect for the profession, but you could see them like really, really struggling. Yeah, I, it is probably the hardest performance art or whatever you want to call it of anything. There was a guy that like wrote all his notes on like his hand, like here. And he would try to do like a really subtle, like, but he, it was so small that he would have to like stare at his hand and then like put it away behind his back as if it was like a sneaky move. <laughs> Thank God. So I'm uncomfortable just hearing about it. <laughs> yeah, it's very cringy. Well, anyway, in the last episode, we talked about our, really my, very painful $130,000 mistake of experimenting with affiliate marketing and all the reasons why I ended up thinking it was a, it was a strategy that was a massive failure. And today we're going to talk about price perception and how if you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. This is actually a quote that I stole from one of my managers when I just graduated from university. And I forgot, like, I think I was working in real estate. I was like in a showroom and it was just something I learned where the people that pay the least are like the squeakiest wheel and like give you the hardest time. And I think a lot of people listening to this can, can identify without and can relate to it. So we're going to share uh, today some stories of the types of users who never activate, who never try the software. So this one could be, I think, quite polarizing because if you haven't actually experienced yourself, you may think that giving away things for free is kind of the way to start a business or like to, to attract customers. So to start, I actually looked up the, the official definition of price perception. So I'm just going to read it out loud. A perception or opinion related to price and that the customers perceive a product's price as low, high, or reasonable, which can have a strong influence on purchasing goals and satisfaction. So I think one of the examples that most people can, can relate to and know is like wine, right? Like the more expensive the wine, the better maybe. Yeah, like lots of experiments and tests, I guess, have proven that to be wrong. Right. Like I think there were like many tests where people put like a high price on a bottle of wine and then like the reviews were higher. Um, or as the actual was like, you know, reverse. So what are your thoughts, I guess, on on price perception, um, especially in in SaaS and software? I mean, this is something that I really learned here because at the companies I'd worked at before, we were building software for an existing user base. So this is the first time where I, I've been in a company where we were directly selling to customers. I remember at the beginning, I was very much like, you know, we have to offer free and, you know, like I was very, very price focused and price sensitive. And you were adamant otherwise from your experience, which I'm grateful for. And then I experienced it painfully firsthand. 
But I mean, like, when, well, like price perception when you're buying something. Oh, when I'm buying something. Yeah. So let's say you are going out to buy something and you are doing research for us for, you know, analytic software, which is the most recent example. Do you feel like you even being in software is influenced by price perception as well? Absolutely. I mean, being bootstrapped, we have very, very strong resource limits, right, in terms of what we can pay. So immediately, I'm, I do realize that there's certain things that just fall outside the realm of possibility for us. But certainly, I'm wary of a newer company that has a really low price, right? Because first of all, they're newer, so I don't know how reliable they are. I don't know if they're going to be around tomorrow. Like a, a very low price is actually, I would say, sometimes often a red flag for me because I was like, what do they, what do they have? If it's so, I mean, it depends on the product, right? Because in a B two B world, I think uh, products are more complex than consumer products. A lot of times, a f truly free version doesn't make sense because they need to learn the product, live with the product for a certain amount of time in order to you know learn the benefit and the value of the product. So you know there needs to be a level of commitment there, and price inherently comes with commitment. The higher the price, the greater the commitment generally. That's how I think about it in terms of my own experience that, yeah, if a really low price, especially for a complex B2B product to me is a red flag. Yeah. I mean, I kind of had to have the same experience, right? Like if we're looking at a particular software and something is like $50 a month to a hundred to 300, then, you know, I'm going to look at the $50 and be like, okay, what's wrong with it? But the question is, if you knew there was a relatively new company that had a similar price as an established company, would that change your perception? on a new company? It depends. I mean, I would have very high expectations of that new company. So if they can deliver, sure. But if they're competing at a price level with the kind of incumbents, the, the established companies, then what's so much better than about their product, right? So okay. I would have much, much higher expectations, but I'd be looking for a big differentiator. So, you know, I don't know that it makes sense necessarily for a new startup who are competing in an existing software category to try to match, like trying to compare compete on price primarily is a race to the bottom. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we have these kind of opinions about any products, right? Like if we're looking at a TV, you know, if something is significantly cheaper, we're actively reading the specs to see what's different about it. Like, what is it lacking, right? What is the resolution? Why is this one so much cheaper than the other one? And even if the specs were in theory the same side by side, we'd be like, no, there's definitely something wrong with this. Right? So I think we do that in, in many aspects of our life, not just software. And I'll often sort high to low right from the beginning like highest price first, because I want to see what's at the high end. And I want to see what's the quote unquote best, because my assumption is that the highest price is going to be the best, which obviously isn't always the case. And even knowing this, even being consumers who are influenced by price perception, I think a lot of startups feel like they can't charge anything at all in the beginning if they have no customers, or they can't charge a lot. We don't apply our psychology of being a consumer you know, to being a vendor. And I don't think enough founders or, or sales teams think the kind of influence that price has for buyers. So I was always like, okay, like when we were coming up with a price, the first ever price for eWebinar, a lot of people say, okay, well, how did you come up with that? And I think we talked about it in, in previous episodes, but like, yeah, you kind of got to make it up. You got to make it up, but you have to be able to justify. But I was always at the mind that we do not want bottom of the barrel customers. We knew in our industry, the kind of solutions that were like basically charging nothing or like very little or like had like, you know, lifetime deals. And we knew the features that they offered and we didn't want to win over that category of customers. But I think what's unfortunate is a lot of startups, maybe they haven't gone through the experience or maybe they don't apply it kind of to the other side, but they start off with charging almost nothing, especially because users or customers know that they're new and they use it to their advantage, right? In my last two companies, because it was enterprise, there were so many people that were like, well, just give it to me for free and my competitor will buy it. But that's never happened. Right. People buy and companies buy, you know, with their own intentions, own buying cycle, own budget. But as a founder, like you don't know that yet. Right. You don't know that like there really isn't 
such a thing as herd mentality, especially that early on. So I think my own experience has always been like, okay, let's not be the cheapest, but let's not be the most expensive because we can't compete. Even when people are like, well, but you guys are new, you should give me a discount. Like the answer was always, you know, no to begin with. Yeah. And I think we also knew when we were very first starting out that we didn't have quote unquote feature parity with we knew we were missing some features, but we had features that set us into a class by ourselves. So it felt like it would have been a mistake to charge quite a bit more. Now that our pricing has matured, that's a little bit different story. But still, our level one customers at 99 bucks a month are still our squeakiest wheels by far. They're the hardest to satisfy. They expect the most. They churn the most. And our level three customers, which is a significantly smaller number, we make the same amount of money from them. And they never ask for anything except maybe like when some when a bug pops up or something like that, but they're they're savvy. They So even with a more mature pricing model than what we had at the beginning, it still rings true that our lowest level tier are our most demanding and most difficult customers. And price doesn't always come in the form of money. I think when people think about, okay, I want to lower my price to attract more people, what they're really saying is I want to lower the obstacle to get to first value. So price in theory is also the number of free days that you can have or a completely free product. And you have to try stuff, right? In the beginning, we right out of the gate offer 30 day free trial because we thought that was standard. And within months, we realized these guys were not activating. Like they were not uploading a video. They would sign up. They would never come back again. You know, we didn't have a lot of tracking, but we had so few customers that we knew what was going on, but people would sign up and like, forget about us. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe 30 days is too long. I think within like the first three months, we already lowered 30 days to 14 days. And that was a risk. Like I never had a self-serve company before, but as soon as that happened, our conversions went up by 20%. And that's massive for a company that's like new to revenue. And it did not impact the signup numbers. In fact, it got people to think twice before signing up because they want to really utilize the trial period. And we had more people in our 30 day trial asked for an extension because they never got started and they forgot it. And that was a, that was a hypothesis that we made was like, maybe that's just a little too long for them to think I can do it tomorrow or I can do it next week. And then they forget about us. When you offer too long of a trial, you can still in theory get monkeys, right? Monkeys in the sense may not be a tough customer. It's just someone who doesn't even end up using your product. And that's something to think about for people who offer a free version of their product, a freemium, right? Like why is a standard freemium conversion 2%? Like 2% is super low and that's standard. I think the idea of freemium is very much attached to the idea of being product led. The thing is, is some products do not lend themselves to a freemium product. Like if you have a small piece of your product that independently can offer value and act as a gateway to a larger, more paid product, then maybe that makes sense to offer something free and then that they can upgrade. But like for us, we're a webinar platform. It's very hard to segment out any part of our platform and have it produce any real value for the customer. So it's kind of an all or nothing thing. So that's why we offer a free trial. And I definitely agree that shortening the trial created urgency for people to learn the product and get going. And we stayed more top of mind when the trial period was shorter. I think it's important to sort of recognize that we're not saying that freemium is bad. It's just, especially with B2B products, I think it's more harmful than helpful more often than people realize. Everyone just sort of thinks free is good. And that's not true. Well, and that's the thing, right? Like the question is, is friction good or bad, right? Some friction is actually good. It's friction in sign up, requiring credit card, friction in onboarding, not having too much help, right? Especially kind of in the product led space. When we started, we were $49.99, $199. Those were our three plans. And then now, you know, we doubled those. We started hearing so many people at some point a couple of years in saying, oh, I, we're signing up for this because it's the cheapest. But we never want it to be the cheapest. And very quickly after we launched a company, we realized, oh, these 49ers, they were signing up because it didn't matter. Like it didn't matter if they lost 49 bucks a month. And because we were doing all of our own support in the beginning, it was so discouraging to work with people who were just like not tech savvy. The people who are most price conscious, why are they the loudest? Because they do not have disposable income. They do not have disposable revenue to try stuff. And they are not 
mature enough in their own business in order to, you know, spend that much time, I guess, on, on trying new products. Whereas people with more money, they may have a team, they may not be doing it themselves, but they're further along in their business. And that was also kind of a, we observed it, but it was also kind of a hypothesis that we made. We were getting so much crappy support, tough customers and mean customers that we were like, okay, let's double prices. And that, that didn't really happen until like one and a half, two years into our journey. But speaking about free products and long trials in my last company, we started with, it was also a SaaS company, but we had a freemium model. Because I thought that if we had more people, we were accessible to more people, we would get more customers and more people would convert and it would be easier for marketing. But we realized very quickly, we realized the people that were the meanest, that demanded the most were people that weren't paying us anything. So it was actually taking time away from people that would actually be good customers. I think we we also touched on this in previous episodes. So from that perspective, it's just not worth giving stuff away because people don't value your product. And that's why they're mean to you. They don't value it. They're not grateful for it. And when we doubled prices, we actually increased increased revenue, even though our conversion went down, but not by very much. I, I think when we had a 30-day trial versus 14, our conversion, I think, went up to something like 70%. I mean, this is insane, right? It's it's just an insane amount. Because at that price, at 49, people could forget about it and they weren't hurt, right? They would just turn in a month or they would ask for a refund. And then when we doubled prices, our conversion went down. So I think our conversion now even sits like, depending on the month, like anywhere from 45 to 55%. But immediately we started making more money. And most importantly, the toughest most loudest customers that we had that needed the most support, like instantly went away. I think our tough customers is also, there's one other phenomenon at play, which is that our solopreneurs, anyone who's on their own, they're going to eventually, they're going to inherently have a limited skill set in certain things. And almost always, frankly, it's in whether or not they're very tech savvy. And I'll tell you the best quote unquote solopreneurs are the ones who have teams, the ones who actually like have somebody helping with the technical side of things, someone who's optimizing their advertising spend or their marketing spend. People who are truly on their own, when they tend to be super fear-driven about not understanding how things work, and they become very, very challenging customers very quickly. Yeah. And to speak about like price perception to quality, sometimes it's not just a perception. Sometimes you know you can only charge that because your product's not very good. We have direct competitors that do lifetime deals all the time. I'm sorry, like it's a, it's a shitty product. But a lot of times that is a product that they use to get people in the funnel so they can upsell them on other things. And I know this because I sign up for all of them. Price perception is not always wrong. It is somewhat justified. And this is actually the problem with lifetime deals and why we would never do a lifetime deal. There's multiple times where I will see a company do a lifetime deal like 99 bucks for, you know, for life. And I'm like, that company is going to go out of business because that is their last money grab. And sure enough, months later or a couple of years later, they go out of business. The only reason you have to sell something for dirt cheap is because it's not good enough. People that buy those lifetime deals, they buy it because they don't have money to spend every month. So think about like the type of audience that you are attracting with the price. And let's say that you are a great product, but you think you need more customers. So you go and do a lifetime deal with one of these platforms. You are now competing with a competitor that is way worse than you, you're getting the same revenue, but you're serving a set of customers that just don't value you. Hey, I'd like to take a second here to talk about my own company, eWebinar, and our mission to rescue people from what I call webinar hell to give them back their time and save them literally hundreds of hours every month through webinar automation. If your sales team is tired of doing the same demo over and over for unqualified leads or worse, prospects who don't even show up, an on-demand demo powered by eWebinar can help them get their time back so they can close more deals. If you're doing customer onboarding and training on repeat, eWebinar can help you automate those so you never have to do them live again. Customer success teams are using eWebinar to run hundreds of sessions every single month without a live host. Why don't you give our product a try and see for yourself? Visit eWebinar.com to join our own on-demand demo or to sign up for a free trial. All right, now that I've gotten that on my system, Let's get back to the episode. 
There's actually a really good blog, which I'll, I'll put in the show notes of this episode, or Active Chat, like a company, a SaaS company. I'm not sure where they're at now. But the title of the blog is How to Survive a 510,000 Launch on AppSumo. And the entire blog details how it was an experience where they attracted a lot of people that would like resell their accounts. People would buy like 20 accounts and they would turn around and resell it for $1,000. And now they're servicing these customers that expect a lot, but they're monthly supporting them because it's it's a complex product, but they're not paying them. So then, you know, the motivation to actually support them actually goes down. Like it's, I mean, basically this guy's like, I, I'm glad I did it at the time, but I would never do it again. And after reading that, I started noticing, oh yeah, like people that go into, you know, lifetime deals are just not that great, but they also use it as this magnet to sell something else. Yeah, I think it's probably like one of the things that we can talk about, uh, which I think we have a lot to say on, is like talking about the types of users who never activate, because I think we have a lot of experience with this. What comes to mind for you? Well, it's definitely what comes to mind immediately is like people that never pay for an account, right? Free accounts. And even though we never had a freemium, like we we tried many different marketing methods and channels. You know, we talked about it last episode, like affiliates, influencers, people who promise to promote your product. In exchange, you have to pay them and or give them free usage of your product. Any partners that we do integrations, co-marketing with that say, Hey, I love your product. I really want to use it for training. Integrate with us. We'll give you ours for free and you can give us yours for free. So that's kind of like a starting to sound like a broken record, right? Anybody who gets a free account because there's no friction. Yeah, but it is different. It's a different kind of variation on that, which I think is important. It's like we were giving free accounts. We never had a freemium model and every free account that we gave went nowhere. Like there was just no investment. They didn't learn the product since they were never looking for the product they never really understood its you know value props so well they weren't invested so they didn't have to learn it you know a lot of these influencers like let's say software influencers affiliates they have massive followings and some of them were using our competitors product like maybe for for many years right and we would give them our solution hoping they would switch over because that's what they said they they would be like i have all these issues with your competitor i want to switch over but i will only do it for a free account because i'm also advertising while i'm using it and then in the end because they're just too lazy to switch or they're too busy they don't end up doing it because there's no timeline to start when it's free maybe i can do it next week or you know, tomorrow or a year from now, there's there's just no urgency to ever get it started. But I think it boils down to just the value. They don't value it, so they don't pay for it, so they don't use it. And I think in the beginning of a startup, it's so tempting to give away things for free. Like a massive influencer comes to you, they've got 500,000 following, which we have experience with, right? This is not a story. Like this actually happened. And they're like, we're going to use this to sell our course or, you know, or do our onboarding, whatever it might be. And then you never hear from them again. And every time you reach out, they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've just been too busy. I'm going to, I'm, I'm definitely going to do it, but they actually never do it. But I think it actually hurts the company more because now I am connected to this person with a big audience. And because I took away their urgency by giving them a free account, they will never see the value of my product. And it doesn't just hurt the company. If you truly believe and if you truly have a better product than what they're using, you're hurting them because they never see it and they're never going to upgrade. And, and, you know, if they're not feeling the pain enough to switch, like, then it doesn't matter either. We've also tried another model where we're like, okay, you can have a free account if you get started. So you have to sign up and pay us. And when you get, when you launch your first webinar, we will refund you. That also didn't work. What happened? Did they just cancel? I mean, there's just no burning desire, right? But I think as a startup, you got to try, you got to try everything. What about promos and coupons? So we definitely, um, it's just like one of those marketing things where we like threw everything against the wall to see what sticks. And we definitely did everything that we could, right? We launched on Product Hunt with a promo code. We had, you know, cross promotions with multiple newsletters for multiple events like Black Friday that we offered promo codes for discounts on price or trial periods. So we've done a lot of that in the first half year. It gave us a lot of eyeballs, but ultimately, like a lot of those people that signed up for deals, like promos, never converted, or they forgot that we existed, and then they wanted a refund the first month and converted. I think like one of the promotions for Black Friday, we did three months free trial. 
Because we're like, hey, more time is better. I think that was like probably before we lowered the the trial period. But we needed to give away something for to be in a newsletter. Right? And these are newsletters with like one or two hundred thousand email addresses, right? So it was worth a try. But in the end, it's just the wrong intention for signing up, right? If you're like, I will try this because it's free. I will, you know, I don't know. I will go into the restaurant and have this appetizer because it's free. It's not because I really want to try it. It's, it's kind of the same psychology. So I think in the end, it was just a wrong intention for signing up and it, it just didn't get us anywhere. I think one of the things we did fairly well though, not in all cases, but in, in a lot of cases is that we realized it wasn't working and moved on fairly quickly. That wasn't true in all cases. And we've talked about some of those in the past, but certainly with promos and free access, we didn't stick with that for very long. The thing is our product is already cheap. So you're talking like $49.99 starting price. So if I give you 20%, it's still not very much, right? Um, so I think that like, I think it would maybe be different if it was a high price point product. They say it was a thousand bucks a month and you give 50% off. I mean, that's significant. Like maybe that's what it takes for me to actually try the product, but the friction to like the price friction to trying our product is already low. So removing that actually did worse for us. Another type of user that never activated and, and by activated, I mean, I think we should define that is, is just someone that never uses the product in order to use eWebinar, you must have a video. So never activated means someone who never even uploaded a video, like didn't even care enough to like click through on their own, not even talking about like launching a webinar and inviting people like these people didn't even try to use the features. They literally just signed up. We made it free and that was it. And so another kind was like, it was kind of another type of influencer or like people with big audiences or integration partners that we wanted to engage because we thought, okay, well, maybe they're not using it because they don't have time to set it up. Let's do the setup for them. Like let's launch it for them. And we did a bunch of those. But I think the important thing here is we didn't write things off. We tried a lot of things and we proved to ourselves that that's not where we want to spend our time because there's better ways to spend our time. So the other part is like accounts we do all the setting up for in hopes to get get them going faster. But that's the, another type of discount. It's another type of removing friction is we remove their time to learn. And by removing their time to learn, their motivation to start was even lower. They didn't even log in. Like there were accounts where we would like create the webinar for them, write all their content, do all the interactions. All they had to do was promote it to their audience and they still didn't do it. That is crazy. I can think of one example where we didn't do it for them, but we did some hand holding, right? Where it worked out. It was still very much on them to do the work, you know, but even then that's only one example. And I know we've tried that multiple times. So, you know, I think sometimes sort of over white glove onboarding kind of thing where you're really like there where there's no friction at all can really backfire. Yeah. I mean, I know it sounds like these are solopreneurs or influencers or whatever, like individual people we were trying to engage, but we also tried to do this for like companies. So uh, we didn't do it for HubSpot, but imagine a HubSpot type company where we would say, hey, we really want you to use it for your onboarding. They have expressed interest. And we're like, we know you're busy. Let us do it for you. They already have a process. They're already using a webinar or a video of some sort. We do everything for them. They have a team and they still went down that path of like never engaging, never logging in, like just never cared. It's so funny. Like even hearing you say that, I'm like, that's a really good idea. I'm like, no, it's not. It seems so logical or seems so like, of course this will work if we like just get them right to the finish line. But it, it definitely did not. I think learning about the product is a path to be delighted by the product. So if you are not using it, how will you ever understand how much more well-built this is or how much more value it offers or how many more features it offers above what you've experienced? You're never going to do that. Yeah. And also there's like strategy behind how you use a product, especially when you're like creating content that you're using the product to like put out there into the world. So you're thinking more than just about using the product. You're thinking about like messaging and you have an investment in the finished product. And if that's missing, then there was no learning that came along with it. I mean, now, like I'm not even phased, right? When people are like, I have written 24 books. I have an audience of 1.5 million. I have a network of 500,000 affiliates. I love your software and I want to join your program. I'm like, great, here's a link. <laughs> 
I'm not even phased. I have yet to meet someone or a company that has that proves me wrong on this. So what what are the conclusions here, right? So I think startups feel like they have to bend over backwards for their customers, especially in the beginning. They have to not charge, give discounts. Like it's oftentimes it is not the right thing to do if your product actually delivers the quality that it promises. And like with free, it's always like, I can do it later. You're removing the urgency. And I think for some companies, especially like B2C, maybe not B2B, but like for some for some types of companies, like a free version definitely works. And that is kind of a go-to-market and like products that have low support, high chance of virality or has some sort of virality. But for most B2B companies, which is what we are in, in our experience, free comes with a price perception that doesn't work for you. Yeah. And we, we didn't really touch on that too much, but like requires low support is a huge component to that. Anything that you're thinking of offering for free, think about what kind of support is going to come with it. And if it comes with anything of significance, it's not worth it. Yeah. And so I I guess as a, you know, after this, you know, multiple experiences that we have, we're very adamant about not giving away discounts and we do not give away free accounts. And if you are a partner or whatnot that says, I can refer this to a lot of my customers. I want a free account. I can, you know, give a lot of value away. Well, our product is a hundred bucks. You can pay for it. And I've definitely said that. And they're like, but we'll give you a free account. I'm like, I don't want it. Like, do not give me a free account because I do not want to give you one. (laughs) Actually, that reminds me of a story. Like I have a friend that I used to know in New York who hates receiving massages because he does not want to return the massage. (laughs) So I'm like that person with software. I'm like, do not give me free software. I don't want to use it. And if I'm, if I want to use it, I respect your business and I'm going to pay for it. Yeah. So like, it doesn't matter who comes over now. I'm like, your value as a company, as a product, doesn't decrease and it shouldn't decrease based on someone's inability to pay for it or see your worth, right? So now we focus on serving customers who know we're the best, who are motivated to invest in the solution, who want to get started, who are excited about it. And if people say, hey, I want a free account because of ABC, like the answer is no. Yeah, because this is as much or more about the kind of customer you're going to get. Like you end up paying, maybe you... (laughs) I don't know, maybe you gain some traction by offering discounts and a free version, but then you end up with terrible customers who are not invested. Yeah. And if someone can't justify the ROI, you just have to be willing to walk away, right? Like the most powerful thing in a negotiation is the ability to walk away. You know, we have a lot of customers that come in or users, not customers yet, that come in and say, hey, do you have nonprofit pricing? Do you have startup pricing? I'm a bootstrap startup. I'm like, well, I'm a bootstrap startup and I'm not profitable. (laughs) I mean, we're like kind of borderline, but like you're probably doing better financially than we are. If you are a nonprofit, it's just too cheap of a product. And a lot of times, like our product is actually tied to revenue, not sales per se. Um, Sometimes it's tied to cost, but like our product allows you to like onboard more, sell more, convert more, activate more, hire less people. Yeah. If you can't justify the number of hours or the amount of money you're going to save by paying 100, 200 bucks, like we're definitely not the product for you. And absolutely. We have people that say, well, then I can't sign up. Yeah. And that's okay. And it's really hard, I think, as a bootstrapped startup when you're starting out to not be overly fearful of that. And it's just like, it's just not worth it. Yeah, but definitely got to try everything. Well, that's the thing too, is that like we tried this stuff and probably if we had listened to a podcast like this, we would have still tried it. I mean, that's the nature of this kind of thing. So just adjust quickly when you try something and it doesn't work, but you got to try stuff especially at the beginning, like what you were saying earlier, it's like when we made up our first price and we were sort of making it up. So I think it's probably a good place to stop. I mean, from all of that, is there one thing that stands out as your hot take for today? I think my hot take is price perception is real. And it's a really good filter for people who value your product enough to pay. So as a startup, like especially if you don't have a ton of customers, you have to have the conviction to charge and charge more as your product gets more built out in line with what your best competitors are charging, but just kind of know where you excel, right? And know where you can't charge. So a perfect example is I know we have like direct competitors, even if it's not our competitors, even if it's just like another software, there are bigger companies that offer live support, CS managers, more custom built products, more white label that can charge 10 times more than their counterpart that self-serve. So why can you do that? Well, because you have a person and it's, it's more tailored and it's enterprise, right? So like have conviction to charge more, but always be in line with 
you know, what's in your industry. Because the only thing you need to do is to back up your value with a great product and hopefully, you know, quick ROI. What is your hot take for, for today? Well, I think mine is think about what customer you want. Because pricing is as much about like, I think it's a lot about what kind of customer do you want to purchase your product? And because I'll tell you the cost that comes with attracting a poor customer is very high and not just in terms of money, but in terms of morale and all those things that with a very small team make a difference. So it's just not worth it. So that, that's the only thing I would add is to say, you know, think about the customer that you want and price your product to attract that customer. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I've got a small favor to ask. The only way Profit Let grows is by word of mouth. So if you'll do us a favor and hit the subscribe or follow button wherever you're listening or watching this podcast right now, it means the world to us. And help us continue to spend time making these episodes for you. Ping me on LinkedIn if there are particular topics you want us to get into this season. Send me any feedback you have on this podcast because I love hearing from you. My name is Melissa Kwan, last name spelled K-W-A-N. To get notified of new episodes, join our mailing list by going to profitled.fm. I promise to only share things you'll actually care about. Thanks for listening. Bye now.